Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Good morning, everyone. My name is Josh Lang. I'm a GU medical oncologist at the University of Wisconsin. So um, you're going to get back-to-back -back medical oncologists here. So we're going to push on that side of things. And really, thank you to Dr. Morgans. Um, in terms of the introduction of the types of therapies that we're using, the things that we have used traditionally in late-stage care for men with metastatic prostate cancer, where we've now moved those earlier in the disease process, and we've frankly found dramatically significant um, improvements in both radiographic progression-free survival, overall survival, and, most, and very importantly, symptomatic disease as well. So what we'll cover in this session is the benefits of chemohormonal therapy in metastatic hormone-sensitive or castrate-sensitive prostate cancer. We'll discuss high versus low volume disease and how that may or may not factor into treatment decision making. And now what we're doing in terms of the development or integration of androgen receptor pathway inhibitors with chemotherapy and the management of patients with this stage of disease. So when we think about cases, and I always like to start with my patients, so let's just jump into our first patient today. So this is a gentleman who's only 62 years old. He presented to his primary care physician with complaints of back and leg pain. He ultimately had a PSA checked. This was his first time having his PSA checked, and he was found to be elevated to 85 nanograms per milliliter, and an X-ray showed lytic lesions in his legs. Staging scans showed widespread nodal disease as well as widespread bone metastatic disease as well. That certainly explains the symptoms that he's presenting within clinic today. His prostate biopsy returns as a Gleason 4 plus 5 and 8 out of 12 cores with greater than 70% involvement. So with that in context, let's talk about a metastatic CSPC or hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. You know, unfortunately, with the most recent data, it's, we're now seeing that roughly 8 to 10 percent of men with their first diagnosis of prostate cancer will have metastatic disease. Note that this is an increase from 3.1 percent of all cases in 2005. I won't talk about PSA screening. I think as this audience well knows the challenges, but also the importance of reintroducing PSA screening for men with, uh, at risk of prostate cancer. Now, we also know that in this population that the use of androgen deprivation therapy alone has a median progression to castration-resistant disease within about 12 months and an overall survival of three years. And again, remember our patient today is only 62. This is a life-threatening and life-limiting disease for him. Now, fortunately, there were a number of clinical trials that started um, really in 2010, 2011, 2012 that were addressing this small, what at the time was a small set of, set of men, but is unfortunately now a much larger percentage of our patients. So when we look at one of the first of these trials, this was the charted trial. So this was a randomized clinical trial for men who had presented with metastatic prostate cancer, and they were randomized to ADT alone or ADT plus docetaxel chemotherapy. Importantly, what they found was that the median overall survival was 57.6 months for the men receiving chemohormonal therapy versus 47.2 months for ADT alone. And I want to highlight this because, as you saw in Dr. Morgan's talk, that in the castration-resistant setting, docetaxel improves median overall survival by just over two months. So two months in the CRPC, CRPC setting compared to 12 to 14 months in the CSPC setting. Now, even more importantly in this study was that they used a stratification criteria that was still, frankly, in development at the time, looking at high versus low volume disease, and found that for those patients that had a higher volume of disease, the median overall survival was 51.2 months versus 34.4 with ADT alone. Contrast to that, low volume disease, there was no improvement in overall survival. So the stratification criteria, there are differences in different clinical trials, so it's important to pay attention. In the charted trial, what they used was uh, defining high volume disease as the presence of visceral metastases or at least four bone lesions with at least one lesion outside the vertebral column or pelvis. Um, again, this also differs from the definition of oligometastatic disease, so there are some variations and it's important to pay attention to the clinical trial design. Now, another confirmatory trial was the STAMPEDE trial. And if you haven't heard about STAMPEDE, it's really a fascinating clinical trial design where patients are continually enrolled to a standard of care arm. However, rather than writing and developing new trials with each new therapy they're interested in studying, they add on new arms of treatment. So in this case, they had a standard of care of ADT alone, and then they added an arm of docetaxel. And what they found was that the addition, for, uh, the addition of docetaxel similarly improved overall survival by 10 months in this case with a median of 81 versus 71 months. Now in terms of docetaxel itself, you've already heard some of this. It's an IV infusion that we'll give it once every three weeks. Importantly, there is no concurrent prednisone for this patient. 
um, with castration sensor disease different <clears throat> than the CRPC setting where we're often using uh, prednisone, which also helps from a palliative perspective for bone pain. Um, it can be given with or without bicalutamide, but concurrent ADT was included in all of these trials. Intermittent ADT was not allowed and is not recommended in this patient population, and no dose reductions were allowed. And they did do PSAs every three weeks and bone and CT scans as well. In terms of toxicities um, from charted and stampede, you know, very similar to what we see in the CRP CRPC setting, a grade three to four febrile neutropenia occurred in about 6.2% of patients. Really, it's quite uncommon and very easy to manage with GCSF prophylaxis and something that we recommend for essentially all men over the age of 65 or in other selected cases. There are other toxicities, including diarrhea, stomatitis, motor neuropathy, sensory neuropathy as well, but all roughly about 1% of patients. I will say that nausea and vomiting is very rare these days. We have far more effective treatments to manage that toxicity and prevent it from happening at all. So something that um, overall for my patients, again, docetaxel is overall pretty well tolerated. And I have many patients that actually work full time while they're getting docetaxel. So for our gentleman, he had been already started on morphine for pain control by his primary care physician. He started chemohormonal therapy, and importantly, all of his pain resolved within four weeks. He had a great response, his PSA nadir to 0.07, and all lymphadenopathy had resolved at the time that we had staging scans done prior to cycle four. Now, what other therapies could we add? So this is also at the time when we, you know, historically, we saw that the development of abiraterone and enzalutamide were happening and FDA approved in the CRPC setting back in 2011, 2012. So another clinical trial was designed, the LATITUDE trial, that enrolled 1,200 patients. Um, in this case, it was a very strict trial design in that it only allowed patients with de novo metastatic prostate cancer. I mean, they did not enroll patients who had had prior radiation or prostatectomy. Men were randomized to ABI plus Lupron or Lupron alone, and importantly saw a significant improvement in overall survival and RPFS rate and delayed cancer progression by 18 months. Um, overall, again, for the most part, I'd say well tolerated. Um, beyond standard androgen dep deprivation therapy, about half of my patients have very few to no side effects from the addition of abiraterone. Though in rare cases, we can see hypertension or hepatotoxicity that is often very easily managed with dose reductions. Another clinical trial, the ARCHES trial, looked at the addition of enzalutamide for a similar patient population and found that um, in this particular study that it was a broader enrollment or eligibility criteria. About two-thirds of patients had distant, met, uh, distant metastases at diagnosis and two-thirds had high volume disease as well. And again, there was a significant improvement in, in this case, radiographic progression-free survival. Um, so other data that continues to accumulate showing that earlier intervention with combination therapy improves outcomes for men with, who present with metastatic prostate cancer. Now, in terms of the ARCHES trial, as previously mentioned, overall uh, relatively well-tolerated therapy. The trial itself was overall, I think, quite well-balanced um, and did show that the benefit of enzalutamide did extend whether it was low or high volume disease. So uh, not necessarily a surprise um, contrasted with the charted trial. So really confirming that for patients who present with metastatic disease, regardless of sites or volume, they should receive treatment intensification. Another clinical trial in the space with apalutamide, again, as described in almost uh, a very similar chemical, chemically, a very similar drug to enzalutamide, and showed that the addition of apalutamide also improved RPFS rate at six months of 68 versus 47 percent, and OS as well. Importantly, there was also a subset of patients that achieved undetectable PSAs, and that itself was also presented by Dr. Niraj Agarwal from uh, the Huntsman Cancer Institute and found that for those patients who achieve an undetectable PSA, their survival is even greater. So we're talking years and years and years of good quality life ahead. So when we look across all of these different phase three trials, what we're able to see is that uh, you know, very consistent results that the addition of AR pathway inhibitors or the addition of docetaxel chemotherapy all improve survival, both RPFS and overall survival for patients who present with metastatic prostate cancer. So we have many different options available to us. So how do we choose? So when we look at some, some, some comparisons from the Stampede trial, looking at docetaxel versus abiraterone, because they had also added another arm using Abby alone, 
And what we saw with Stampede was that there was essentially no difference in overall survival. Um, when we think about some of the other uh, impacts in terms of that may be important, whether that's PSA progression, it looks like there may have been some improvements or favoring aberrant acetate, but again, no improvement in OS. Now, when we think about quality of life, and I want to highlight this particular slide because we're actually going to come back to it later in the, in the uh, today when we talk in more detail about the card trial, but that docetaxel did have a decreased quality of life, not unexpectedly, during the administration of chemotherapy itself compared to abiraterone. However, at the completion of chemotherapy, those men all returned to a very similar quality of life as those who were being treated with abiraterone. As one of my patients said, you're telling me I don't have to take four horse pills a day. That's a good thing for me. So again, there's some decision points here for patients that can be important. But how do we choose? And I think this is another challenge that we face. So cost is always critical. And um, traditionally, we think of docetaxel as the least expensive of all therapies, especially as an IV infusion. However, as Dr. Moses presented earlier, abiraterone is now generic. And with other cost assistance programs, the cost of abiraterone has significantly improved. Um, enzalutamide and apalutamide continue to be two of the more expensive drugs. Um, challenges that we face are drug assistance programs um, no longer exist for those therapies. So those can be cost prohibitive for patients um, in this setting. But what about triplet therapy? So we've talked about the use of docetaxel and ADT in some settings, the use of AR pathway inhibitors in ADT and other clinical trials. What about the combination? Can we bring these therapies together? So two very important trials were just very recently presented asking a portion of this question. And what I mean by that is that patients were enrolled and randomized to receive either ADT and docetaxel or ADT, docetaxel, and darolutamide in the Aresense trial. Note that there was not an ADT darolutamide arm alone. However, very importantly, what they found was that the addition of an AR pathway inhibitor to ADT and docetaxel significantly improved um, risk of death, 32.5% uh, improvement um, compared to ADT, docetaxel, and placebo. RPF, RPFS, OS, and every other re relevant clinical endpoint was also improved with the addition of darolutamide in the Aresense trial. Um, from a toxicity perspective, also very similar, though fatigue seemed to be more significant in those patients receiving darolutamide. Now, there was another study that was done completely independently called PEACE-1. Um, a little bit more of a complicated trial, but in terms of the relative in arms for this discussion, there was a similar design of ADT and docetaxel with or without abiraterone. Importantly, almost identical clinical results in terms of relevant clinical endpoints with RPFS, OS, and others. And importantly, what they found in this trial with piece one of these two subarms, that the median duration of uh, benefit was four and a half years with a combination versus two years for those patients receiving ADT and docetaxel alone. So again, everything coming to, together to say that these are patients who should receive these combination therapies. And these are slides just showing the improvements when we are looking at um, uh, overall survival again, and importantly, there's also a tail in the darolutamide arm that is quite important here. Um, when we look at the other combinations, I'm going to jump ahead a couple slides just as we're running a little bit out of time here. Um, and this is also now confirming again with abiraterone showing the Kaplan-Meier curves of overall survival was significantly improved with the addition of abiraterone. Now, one of the other important questions that come up, comes up, however, was that, again, there was not a control arm of ADT and abiraterone or ADT and darolutamide to directly compare against. So how do we choose? How do we make these decisions across the doublets or the triplets? Um, there's a lot of exciting research that's yet to come. So I know that many of the investigators are doing other post hoc analyses and especially looking at genomic profiles. So are there some features that would suggest patients would be more likely to benefit from the addition of docetaxel? I think similar to what Dr. Morgan's presented earlier as we perform in the CRPC setting, that for patients who have metastatic CSPC, that those that have visceral involvement more likely to have other high-risk genomic mutations, P53, RB, or P10. Those are patients who are much more likely to benefit from the addition of docetaxel. Now contrast that with a patient who presents who, and I will say, all patients with metastatic cancer should have germline and somatic tumor testing performed. And what that allows us to identify is some other high risk or low risk features. 
So I have patients who present with metastatic prostate cancer with lymph node only disease and on molecular testing have a bland genomic profile. In fact, some don't even have any detectable genetic alterations at all. Those are patients I feel very confident about the addition of using a doublet therapy of ADT and Abbey or ADT and enzalutamide, for example. However, those patients that have higher volume, higher risk features, high risk genomic features, always should receive docetaxel. We'll have more confirmatory evidence coming out, but again, I think we can extrapolate from what we see in the CRPC setting with these same therapies into the CSPC setting. So with that, that's the end of this discussion today, and I think we'll move on. I think we're gonna have a little bit more of a change in schedule, and uh, Dr. Gerard can guide us on what that's gonna look like. Thank you so much, everyone.